Uh, now, I'm going to quote uh, some of the important passages about the Paraclete from Jonin writings here, uh, which we skipped or which we just, you know, uh, talked about from a uh, very basic perspective. So now we are going to quote, quote the exact passages where Jesus talk about the Paraclete. So uh, the writer, according to St. John, was emphasizing about the coming of substitute of Jesus, who is going to be the final hope for human resist uh, resistance to remove this world from sins and bringing the art of repentance and hope. So uh, I'm going to go a little quick here from chapter 14 all the way to uh, chapter 16, and then I'll summarize whatever Jesus foretold uh, about this person. So here uh, are some of the conditions to, to accept and recognize the substitute of Jesus. Number one, if you love me, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So Jesus is uh, telling the disciples that, uh, your love for me, I need to know that you kept my commandments. So this is going to be the condition of love. Uh, number two, he said that the Father will give you another paraclete to be with you forever. We will discuss that, what does forever mean. Then, number three, uh, he says that uh, the paraclete is going to come in in the name of Jesus. And we'll talk about that as well. What does it mean to come in the name of Jesus? Uh, number four, paraclete is going to teach you everything. Everything means everything. Uh, number five, uh, Paraclete is going to remind you of Jesus' saying, his action, his commands. Uh, this is what uh, John is talking about. Uh, number six is uh, that uh, uh, Paraclete will glorify Jesus. He will, He's going to testify Jesus accepting his messiahship, that he's a prophet of God, a messenger of God, a word of God, a, uh, a messiah of God. And uh, seventh one is, uh, number seven is that he will guide you unto all all truth so the, the paraclete will not speak of himself but only what he hears and uh, here i think I, I missed out something hey, yeah this one so jesus here also mentioned that uh, the paraclete will only arrive after the jesus after jesus departure so this is what i summarized in uh, 10 points that he will come after jesus he will substitute jesus he will come in jesus name he will only speak what he hears. He will glorify Jesus as Messiah. He will remind of Jesus' commandments, what, what he taught to uh, Christian brethren. He will teach many things, many things. The emphasis of many is really important in this presentation throughout our stream, inshallah. And um, he'll guide to, to all the uh, all that is the truth, that is truth, and he will predict the future, and he'll be there forever. So and now there are some important highlights I want to bring that, that need to be reminded here. You might have noticed that all this time till now and in my previous presentation from last week, I have been using the term paraclete all this time, paraclete, and not any English alternative to it. Why is that? Before I move further, let's let's read this passage. Uh, this is from Gospel of John, the book Gospel of John uh, by Beth Shepherd. According to Brown, uh, Raven Brown, uh, a very renowned Christian scholar, an accurate translation of the word paraclete is confounded by the fact that there is no real Hebrew equivalent to it. Now, this is something really important. As I told uh, you guys that... Uh, at one point, it sounds like some impersonal spook or a ghost is being, being you know, discussed here. And at the very same time, when we look at the passage, it talks about an arrival of something or someone. His personality is being discussed. And it sounds like he's a human being who's going to communicate, who's going to, uh, you know, help uh, be an advocate uh, for early Christians or disciples of Jesus or, you know, a guide, a teacher and a master of all these people at the very same time. And I'll read this passage here. It's from uh, the notion of the Holy Spirit as Paraclete, page two. Uh, there's a, this is a research work by, I think, uh, Pentecostal Church, uh, which men mentioned that most researchers do not accept that early Christians, early Christian church had a unified, highly developed uh, pneumatology from the very start, but that their pneumatology is the result of process of development in their thinking about the work of the Spirit. So even early church, uh, in, in early church, the, the leading figures of the church, they were not, you know, unanimously agreed about the who this, uh, you know, paraclete figure is. They, they didn't have any unified or highly developed, you know, pneumatology about this spirit, this spirit passage. Uh, they were even confused about that, whether it's going to be a ghost or whether it's going to be a human being. And uh, this is what uh, also discussed in the same uh, article that what does the context of the Johannine usage of passage indicates that in terms of the meaning of the term, should it be understood in terms of a comforter or exhorter, counselor, helper, teacher, or master? 
or are the functions attributed to the paracletos in John 14, 16 consistent with forensic settings and associated uh, sense of advocate? So they were all confused about that because this word paraclete is really hard to be translated in English language. Like for instance, those who understand the Arabic language and those who understand the Urdu language. Uh, Brother Faisal is here. He understands the Ur Urdu language. He can you know, uh, testify that the word ghayra, ghayra or ghayrat in Urdu or Arabic it might sound like if you want to translate the word ghayra or ghayrat in in english language someone might say that it means someone who is a, who is modest but there's a very loose translation there's a very shallow translation like like the term ghayra you cannot even translate it in english in one word you cannot even summarize it in one word so this is the same thing and there there are many languages which don't have good alternatives to their specific words or terminology so this is what uh, you know scholars uh, scholarly works uh, are talking about that this paraclete is not uh, to be translated in one word this this cannot be you know uh, put in one bottle only and see it through that lens so this is a very broad term and uh, another quote here from glenn uh, nelson's book the work of the holy spirit in the light of john 14 16 page 20 to 21 uh, it reads here that difficulty reveals itself in the attempt to translate the term some suggestions are comforter advocate intercessor convincer strengthener helper and friend but none have met with widespread approval they all fail to capture accurately and comprehensively john's use of the child so this is this needs to be addressed because before you know I move on further to to make people understand that uh, how this uh, why this paraclete figure has always been debatable among the among the early Christians. So uh, next I'm going to quote a passage here, the the, Ar the Arthur Palombo, and he writes in the, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Personages of Earliest Christianity. He quotes this passage from Robert Esler. He says that uh, first. Arthur Palombo says that the paraclete mentioned several times in the Gospel of John is usually, usually identified with Holy Spirit, who after the death of and resurrection of Jesus would appear to the apostles in the times of need to help and comfort them. However, Robert Esler had this to say about, uh, about the designation. He says that the paraclete, the foretold alter ego of Jesus, is not a ghost but a man, but a living man. A re reincarnation of Jesus. Reincarnation in not a physical sense, but in a sense that this paraclete figure, this human being, will remind you of Jesus. Like he's gonna talk like Jesus, he's gonna walk like Jesus. This is what he meant when he says the reincarnation of Jesus. He will testify that the first paraclete, Jesus, was and is the true Messiah. The first paraclete is gonna testify about what? That Jesus was and is the true Messiah. Now there are uh, two emphases here. Uh, the first one is that he's going to testify that Jesus was the Messiah, which talks about his first ministry when, when he came 2,000 years ago. And is the true Messiah is emphasizing about his second coming, that if someone who comes uh, claim to be Christ in the future, it has to be Jesus as well. So that prophet or that human figure is going to say that Jesus was the Messiah. And if somebody comes, he proclaims to be the true Messiah, that person has to be Jesus or else he's a false Messiah. So... Uh, if any brother wants to add anything else, then we will inshallah move on. If uh, uh, anyone joined us uh, and need to be introduced, inshallah. Faisal yeah, assalamu alaikum. Uh, assalamu alaikum, brother DeAndre and uh, brother Vasalat. A question here, not, not just a question, it's more of an observation. So the idea of the paraclete, which uh, we're discussing here, first of all, this is not a... Um, it's not a Jewish concept that is being discussed. The word paraclete itself signifies that and a substitute word is being used to explain a Jewish concept at this time, right? And um, the Jewish concept- The Jewish audience is being addressed. Is, is, is this what you mean? Yeah, so what I mean is the original mm -hmm. wordings that uh, uh, Jesus, peace be upon him, would have used would mm -hmm. have denoted a Jewish concept of uh, someone coming, right? Mm -hmm. Not the word paraclete, okay? Right. It got lost in translation when it was translated into Greek, and the word paraclete, when it's being used, it denotes something which we no longer know. We've lost that, right? What what the original word was. Now, Correct. we're looking at the word paraclete, so now we sort of have to not only um, demystify this word itself, 
the paraclete, but we also need to demystify what it was actually being used to mean, correct? All right. Okay, and then when you're talking about the word paraclete, so at this point in time, we're only discussing how uh, the Greek word paraclete can be understood. All right. Yeah. And it, 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 this, is, this is why, yeah, yeah, brother Ali, you, you want to show yourself. No, no, go ahead and finish. I was going to ask something afterwards, but go ahead and finish, Ali. Yeah, because uh, this is exactly what we discussed, yeah, and we have been discussed that there is a there is a huge disagreement between even the even the modern day scholars that you cannot translate this word apparently and just you know with come up with one terminology. Even even the advocate the word we we see recently in modern translation, uh, the scholars dis disagree about the word advocate because advocate's job is to come to defend the victim and then he's gone. So it's like. Jesus promised that he's going to be with you forever and he's going to be your counselor, he's your master, your teacher at the same time. And being a teacher, you need to be with, with, with them, with, with these students. There's a relation between, there's a huge relationship between the master and teacher where teacher is, is present among them or his work is present among them. And the students is there, you know, he, he you know, uh, listen to the teacher or in, in to, do, do the inter interpretation of his work. So this is why the, the scholars have always been confused about that, that, you know, this this term paraclete, first of all, we don't even know, as I quoted John, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Brown here, uh, that uh, the the confounded by the fact, uh, the, by the fact that, that there is no the real Hebrew equivalent to that. Like, uh, we don't know what Jesus, said the word in Hebrew or Aramaic, the, the, the most, uh, uh, the passage we have in the, the Syriac passage we have is either uh, Faraklit, which is uh, Paraklit in, in Greek, or uh, Manahmana, which, is, which we discussed uh, uh, in, our last, uh, in, in our last presentation, part one, uh, uh, almost a week ago. So they were, they've always been confused about that. What did Jesus actually say? Did he say Faraklid or did, did he say Manachmana? And how do we, you know, carry on with this passage? So I hope to, uh, that uh, answers the question. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I, before we continue, I just want to say something. So uh, awesome Lawson clips. Uh, we've lost the original word, but we know it's Muhammad. Uh, great that you're uh, uh, saying wait, that. Wait, wait, wait. We, want you, we want you to stick around, yes. listen to the whole presentation. If you feel that uh, it doesn't make sense or you want to challenge it, by all means, uh, we'll open it up for you later. Uh, and uh, you can come on and uh, tell us why you feel that uh, we've got it wrong. Right. Alhamdulillah, Andre, summa, alhamdulillah said, these guys don't know that I am prepared for that too. That when, when he said, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to highlight that, that again, sorry, uh, brother Fawad. Oh, and he said that we have lost the original, but we know it's Muhammad. I'm. You, this is exactly the you know some something I was actually hoping to, uh, to come from you guys because I'm gonna execute that as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. You okay. know what? And, but, by the way, um, but by the way, DeAndre, the yeah. the comment said, um, apparently we lost the original language, but we but not but not yeah we lost the original language, but not but now it's Muhammad. All of a sudden. I, I'll read yeah. it out. Uh, um... Yeah, I think I've paraphrased it. Well, <clears throat> let me go back and check. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Okay. We've, we've lost, lost, the, we've lost the original word, but we know it's Muhammad. Yeah. But yeah, um, that that's all I, I wanted to add. I wanted to add on one comment. When you were talking about how paraclete is not necessarily a Jewish concept, that reminded me actually, because if we're looking at the Jewish context, or even the, if you're using the Old Testament, the Messiah was supposed to have been someone, you know, who even Christians see as the Savior. Well, for one, Jews, both the Jews and Christians view the coming, at least the Christians at that time, have been known to have been viewed the Messiah as when he shows up, it, the end of the world is coming. The end of the world, it's, it's, it's near, basically. That's why even Jews think the Messiah appearing is that the end times are near. So that's when everything is going to be situated with. My question, my question is, and it's something I've actually just thought about. If the Messiah is, you know, I don't know the fact that the Messiah is Jesus, according to that, um, according to that um, narrative, if the Messiah truly came as a quote-unquote savior, why is he talking about another comforter? Why is he mentioning another person to come after him? If he was supposed to be the fine all in all, and two, That's, why is that uh, why is that helper not foretold in the Old Testament? Well, why who was not foretold in the Old Testament? 
the helper, the paraclete, the one who was supposed to come after him. You know, I must, if I go, if I mm. don't go, he right. will not come. Why was not, for, why was that not foretold? Why was that, in, there no prophecy about that? If that's such a, he, a, he will guide you, to, you know, someone who will guide you unto all truths. That seems pretty important to me. I don't know about you guys, but it sounds like something, it seems like something that's pretty important. Why was that not foretold in the Old Testament? No, I think this is, this is a very brilliant question. And uh, uh, I, I I don't think I have a very good answer for that. I think a Christian might be, because this question needs to be addressed to our Christian, uh, Christian audience that have, why such an important figure with Jesus is going to, is Jesus is predicting that he's gonna he's he's bringing all truth to you. He's gonna you know teach you many things, and he'll be with you forever. That uh, salvific type of figure who's gonna you know uh, remove the sins of the world. He's gonna bring the repentance and hope and everything, and he's gonna be you know substitute of Jesus. And in some in in some passages of John, it talks about someone who is greater than Jesus. The Paracletus talked about being greater than Jesus. This is going to be, you know, superior than him. So this is a really, this is a very baffling question. And I think this is a very a good point that why uh, Old Testament, let alone New Testament, we have, you know, the New Testament, do to, uh, do, let's talk about that. Uh, but why Old Testament doesn't discuss that? This is exactly why, why we, you know, we come forth and we put this question against them that why do we accept Jesus, Muhammad, Paul Salam, has to be uh, has to be that paraclete, and why he being he being the final messenger of God or prophet of God, uh, he has to be foretold in the old works of the Jewish prophets as well. And uh, one more thing is that I think your original to your original question is that whatever uh, is being told is being told to Jewish audience, so it has to be seen from Jewish lens, not from Greek or Roman pagan you know uh, understanding. Like if we talk about John 1, 1, it talks about in the beginning was a word and the word was with God and the word was God. So this passage itself, if, if you believe John to be a Jewish person, it it, it has to be, if, 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 if John is someone who wrote it, then it has to be understood from uh, the Jewish perspective. Uh, if 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 that if that passage is read to someone who is a, who is from a Jewish background or had a, a Jewish understanding, uh, do that person believe that person to be a God or someone who is a sub, uh, who is a, who is a sub, uh, sub subservient to God or, or uh, subordinate to God. So the, 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 the there's a thin line between that, that uh, Jewish stuff is being understood from a Gentile perspective. This is why uh, the problem uh, arises in uh, most of the text from uh, uh, of, of the New Testament, that Jewish text is, or Jewish people are being, or their ideology is being, you know, judged through the lenses of the Gentiles. So this is this, this is about how, how I could tackle uh, that question. Uh, otherwise, this question actually goes back to, uh, Christians that, that they, they have to you know talk about that why this uh, particular figure is not being discussed. So yeah, I guess uh, time to move on with the rest of our part. So okay, so the that brother awesome lost some clips. So uh, time for you to you know, <laughs> uh, time for you to recharge or you know call your Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost in you because it is very much needed when you join our state in Charles. See. Yeah, Happy. this is this is this is what I don't like. It's things like this that <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's running. Did he say something else? No. Well, he said, "Have a good night." After that comment he made, he said, "Have a good night." Okay. Holy sweet the trait. <laughs> he was looking. The brother was looking forward to it, but uh, I, I guess not. You, you let him down. But anyways. Hmm. I, anyways, I uh, yeah, just like well. Okay. Uh, so there's a passage. Uh, now I'm going to speak from is Islamic perspective here. Uh, and all, all, all I'm going to speak is from, from Islamic, Islamic perspective. Because in previous presentation and even this one, I tried my best to not indulge uh, any Islamic text or any Islamic references or even talk about, uh, you know, Prophet Muhammad or any uh, other uh, Islamic figure that he could be, you know, Omar or, you know, Ali or someone like that. So I, I left that out so people can grasp my concept that whatever I'm talking about is uh, is related to something which is from a non-Muslim source. Now we come to the Muslim source. The the most uh, authentic, the most authoritative source we have is uh, the Holy Quran, the book that is revealed to Prophet Muhammad, and it reads like this. Uh, بَعْدَذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيَّ مِنَ التَّوْرَاةِ وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِي اسْمُهُ أَحْمَدٌ It translates that uh, when Jesus, son of Mary, said that, O children of Israel, 
inni rasulullahi ilaykum verily indeed i am a messenger of god sent to you alaykum musaddiqan lima bayna yadayya min at-tawrat and i'm going to confirm whatever is revealed before me in torah in to- in torah in the law given to moses wa mubashshiran bi rasuli and i'm going to give you the glad tidings of a messenger uh rasuli min ba'di who will come after me ismuhu ahmad whose name shall be ahmad now this word ahmad here it uh, i think no uh, let's talk about it later uh, when we have callers inshallah i'm going to you know not spoil this moment here so anyways oh he's putting it in his back uh, pocket <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what I am uh, what I am you know emphasizing mm-hmm. here that in, even in the Quranic text we find a quotation from Jesus where he's you know addressing children of Israel he's confirming his mens- messengership his messiahship his prophethood that uh, indeed I'm a messenger of God a prophet of God a messiah of God is sent to you and he's also predicting that there's going to be a messenger who is who's going to come after me there'll be a prophet and another messiah so jesus is predicting predicting someone who is going to come after him and whose name shall be ahmad now let's skip this message for a while let's skip jesus predicting uh, create a hypothesis here that jesus didn't predict his name just just for the sake of argument that jesus predict there is a messenger who is going to come after him i'm going to read a passage to you guys and this is going to be really fascinating for all the panelists who are watching specifically muslims and all the christians uh, in the chat or and the muslim brother uh, brother in as well in the chat now i'm not here uh, and 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 i would really dislike if you dis- if you spoil that moment while i'm reading this passage please please don't specifically our muslim brothers please please don't spoil this passage while i'm reading this so i came uh, something um A few days ago, I read a passage here, which I'm quoting to you now, and I read read a story about Jesus, uh, and it reads like this: In Jerusalem, one day, amidst the sacred surroundings of the temple, a nomadic individual paused to relieve himself, like he had a call of nature, and he was roaming around Jerusalem, and he reached near the temple, and he wanted to relieve himself. He wanted to, you know, most likely urinate. in a corner where jesus and his disciples were gathered reacting swiftly the disciples admonished him and moved to intervene like he was urinating he was passing his urine he was relieving himself near the temple or at the corner of the temple while jesus and disciples were you know sitting there uh, jesus might be preaching something there so when they saw that the man is urinating in the temple temple of god uh, you know the house of god which is which is most likely going to be unclean because uh, because of its u- urination so seeking to prevent any further uh, defilement of the holy space however like when disciples wanted to intervene however jesus intervened jesus urged has and he told the disciple he stopped the disciple and he told them let him be let him relieve himself let him you know uh, complete his you know the whole session of call of nature he instructed that to the disciples as the man completes completed his acts his, his act jesus called him and offered gentle counsel jesus called him and offered gentle counsel and he jesus told him these centuries are not uh, uh, intended for impurities but solely for the worship of, of god prayer and study of the scriptures this is the, the teacher kind of attitude the one who is counsel the one who is a teacher the one who is an advocate the one who is a uh, a master a guide a a helper you know gesturing towards the sport he looked at his disciples uh, gesturing towards the sport jesus directed that to be cleansed with water remarking your mission is to alleviate burden and not to impose them he told the disciple that you should have never intervened stopping that person you are not you know meant to you know burden people your mission is to uh, alleviate burdens from the people so do the things which is best for you now many of the brothers here know that know that story and uh, muslim uh, panelists might be smiling because uh, and the and, and the people who are uh, actually uh, watching through youtube and who are in the chat as well they might be smiling all this time knowing that we know this story we know uh, their story so this is the exact story mentioned and this is the story that is mentioned in islamic tradition and it is not related to jesus but prophet muhammad and i'm going to narrate uh, i'm i'm going to you know quote the narration to you quote and quote uh, 
while we were, the, the, there's a companion of uh, Prophet Muhammad saying that while we were in the mosque, a Bedouin came and began to, un, uh, to, to urinate, promoting cries of protest uh, from companions, sensing the unrest. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam intervened, advising restraint, let him be. He instructed his disciples, his followers or his companions. When he, the man who was urinating, finished, the Prophet said, cleanse the area with water for you have been sent only to make things easy and not to make things difficult. Addressing the Bedouin, the Prophet وسلم, gently reminded him, these sacred spaces are not meant for impurities, but solely for the remem remembrance of Allah, remembrance of God, prayer, and the recitation of his holy book, the Quran. Now, what I'm trying to emphasize here is that this is how Jesus, when, like for instance, if, if you narrate that story to someone who doesn't know the background of that story, if you go to any church, to any pastor, any preacher, and you quote that story and you you you, you tell them, I, I found that, uh, that story in some uh, apocrypha or in some manuscript, uh, which are not authentic, but this story sounds like, you know, uh, sounds really nice. And if someone's going to read that story through the lenses of uh, Jesus, that Jesus is, what is, is, is the one who is preaching here, they are wholeheartedly going to accept that. They are wholeheartedly going to accept that narration because they know how their master Jesus talked like. And this is how prophets of God, they move, they talk, they walk. This is how they become, this is, this, this is a teacher kind of attitude, a guide kind of attitude, you know, a counselor kind of attitude. And this is what exactly Jesus foretold that the counselor or the paraclete, not counselor, the paraclete who's going to come after me, he's going to be like, you know, walking, talking me. The, re the reincarnation of Jesus, as other scholars mentioned. He's going to be like, you know, mirror image of Jesus. Like when, when you see his actions, you're, you, he's going to remind you of, wow, there's the teaching of the Messiah. This is what we read in the Old Testament and New Testament. This is how prophets of God, you know, advise the people. So uh, if any brother wants to anything uh, add, add anything to that, then we'll, inshallah, uh, move on further. Yeah, no, this is, uh, <clears throat> I, I remember reading this um, for the prophet, peace be upon him. Definitely, it's there's so many parallels here. And it shows the, this is really what you expect from a prophet, right? That's that's what you would expect a prophet would do, a prophet from God. They're here to perfect the uh, the best of manners. And uh, the fact that the prophet, peace be upon him, and Jesus, peace be upon him, both of them reacted in a very similar way, shows the, uh, the single purpose and the single source of their, uh, what they were teaching and what where they were getting what they were teaching us from, right? This is uh, this is really interesting the comparison. Right, there's another narration now. Now for those who are Christians, they can imagine Jesus here. This is a narration about Prophet Muhammad, Muhammad peace be upon him. But uh, for for just for just tiny good minutes, uh, you just imagine that it is it is Jesus who is talking. Okay, a young man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad, peace be upon him, and he said, O Messenger of God, O Messenger of Allah, give me permission to commit adultery. The Prophet said, come here. The young man came close and he told him to sit down. The Prophet, or Jesus from Christian perspective, I, I, I ask you guys to imagine that this is the narration about Jesus. Just close your eyes and imagine. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, would you like that for your mother or daughter, sister or aunt, maternal or paternal? The man said, no, I swear to God, I swear to Allah. The, the one who made you, who sent you as a messenger, right? Uh, I won't like that. The prophet said, neither would people like it for their mothers, daughters, sisters and aunt too. The prophet ﷺ placed his hand on him and he said, oh Allah, forgive his sins purify his heart, and guide his chastity. After that, the young man never again inclined to anything sinful. Now, this is the way, this is the spirit of counselor. This is the spirit of a teacher, a master, a helper, an advocate. You know, the man is a victim here, the victim of fornication or his, you know, sexual thoughts. And he came that, prophet, please allow me to commit adultery once, at least once. And the prophet is like, would you like it for your mother or your daughter or your sister or your aunt? No. So the man disagreed. And then he, he, he gave, you know, alternative advice for that. 
that nobody's going to lie for their mother or sister or daughter or aunt too. And then Prophet provide this, this spiritual healing, forgiveness for him, purification of his heart and guarding his chastity. And then this is one of his miracles when he places his hand on that guy's chest. The man, he, uh, the, the man that is being talked about, he said uh, that the young man never again inclined to anything sin sinful. Like he didn't even feel like to commit sexual uh, immorality in his life. Further, so this is uh, one of the passages uh, I wanted to talk about. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 21 to 24, Jesus said, If you want to be perfect, go sell your possession and give to, give, it, give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. So if we, if someone who's, who reads uh, Matthew 19, they know that it talks about a man coming to Jesus and asking that, uh, good Lord, what do you think is the, is the greatest of the commandment? And Jesus is like, why do you call me good? There is no good but God alone. If you want to enter heaven, if you want to be in the kingdom of God, you got to keep the commandments. This is what Jesus is preaching about, keeping the commandments. He's always talking about keeping the commandments. Love all your, uh, love your God all with your mind and your uh, you know, heart. He put certain you know, commandments like you know, honor your mother and father and do not commit adultery, do not commit fornication or you know, uh, steal or murder. Uh, all, all the you know, parts of the Old Testament uh, or some of the parts of the Old Testament he quoted. And then the guy, the, the, the Jewish guy, he was like, uh, but the master, I, you know, I, I follow all these things. Tell me something which is new. Tell me something which is unique. Tell me something which is not told to the old prophets. Your teaching might inspire me in a different way. So Jesus is here. Okay, you want to be smart? You want, you want to be smart here? Okay, let's do this. Go and sell all you got and give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. When a young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus knew that. Jesus being a Jew, he knew how smart Jews were. So he was, you know, playing, he, he was playing over smart over them. So Jesus said to his disciples, and this, this is what I loved about, you know, reading when, whenever I read the passage of Jesus, he used to, you know, like turn the table on those Pharisees and chief priests and other, uh, you know, normal people when they, they, they tried playing, you know, tricking Jesus, Jesus, you know, turning the table. This is what I loved about, you know, his, his past, certain passages in the Bible, especially, specifically in uh, Synoptic Gospels. So Jesus said here, Truly, I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, this is something really amazing here. Jesus gives this idea that if you want to help poor, give charity. Giving charity, this is what Jesus is, you know, uh, preaching here. That how do you give charity? By providing someone with materialistic need. Like you have to spend on someone to help uh, someone, like giving a charity in that sense. Now, Prophet Muhammad came and he came with a broader meaning of the, this, this term charity. We all know throughout the world from, you know, from Africa to New Zealand or, you know, other uh, islands there, the far island uh, to the east. Every Tom, Dick and Harry knows that the, the word charity means giving, helping someone, having, helping someone poor with cash or with your asset, like with food or stuff like that. But Prophet Muhammad came here, and this is what Jesus said, that he's, he's going to guide you all to, toward all truth. He's going to teach you many things. I have yet many things to say, to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. Like he's going to show you things from different, different perspectives. So Prophet Sallallahu said here, this uh, narration is mentioned in Riyadh Salihin and in other uh, books as well. He said, charity is obligatory every day on every point on, on, of a human uh, every joint of a human being, sorry. If one helps a person in matters of uh, concerning his riding animal, or in today's uh, term we can say vehicle, by helping him to ride it, or by lifting his luggage on it, all this will be regarded as, regarded as charity. A good word and every step one takes to offer the compulsory congregational prayer uh, in the mosque, of course, is regarding as charity. And guiding someone on the road is regarded as charity. Your removal of a rock, a thorn, or a bone from the road is charity. Charity for you. You're pouring what remains from your bucket into the bucket of your brother is charity for you. This is exactly what Jesus was talking about when he said that he's going to guide you into all truth. Now show me any, any passage in the New Testament that presented this broad meaning of the word charity alone. And I, have, I, I can talk about that all day or all night for you guys, for those who are watching, watching from the West. Like I can quote Jesus one passage and I can give countless examples from Islamic tradition that what 
Prophet Muhammad, you know, elaborated Jesus' teaching in a very broader term. Um, I guess we have limited time, but I, 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 I'm really enjoying talking about that. And I hope you guys are, you know, enjoying this conversation as well. So, but we are running out of time. So we need to, you know, cover that as much as we can. There's another narration uh, reported by Jabir radiallahu where Prophet sallam said, um, okay. He said, never does a believer plant a tree except that he has, re he has the reward for charity for him. Now, no one ever, ever, ever thought in Jesus' time or even in today's world that how can planting a tree be charity for me? Because the term charity is seen something like giving, helping someone uh, with materialistic stuff, like giving someone food or uh, uh, giving someone money. So for what is eating out of that is charity. What is, okay. This part, what is eating out of that is charity can be understood. Okay, this man planted a tree and he did a tree of an apple or a mango or orange, and he's giving out uh, the product as a charity. This is, this, is, this is understandable. Now, the prophet said that what is stolen out of that is charity. What the beast eats out of that is charity. What the birds eat out of that is charity for him. In short, none incurs a loss to him, but it becomes a charity in charity to his on, on his part. Okay, there's another narration in Sunan Nisai where Prophet وسلم, said, giving charity to a poor person is charity and giving to a relative is two things, a charity and uplifting, uh, sorry, upholding the ties of kinship. Now, this is very, very amazing passage here. You being a Christian or being a Muslim might think that if I help my brethren, like my blood relative, if I, if God gave me a CEO of a certain company or if I, you know, work in a stock market and I have, you know, a handsome income and I have an elder, bro I have an elder brother or, you know, younger sister, they are, they might be, you know, going through some inflation. They might not be, you know, well uh, established and they might be suffering from, you know, lack of food or they can't pay the bills. So I might going to go and help them. It could be your mother, it, it could be your parents, it could be your siblings, it could be your, you know, uh, maternal uncles, aunties, or even your cousins, first cousins, second cousins. So that person might be thinking that the charity I'm giving him, I'm going to earn reward for that. But Prophet Muhammad is telling that if you give charity to your nearest kin, your relative, your blood relative, you earn two rewards, one for charity and one for, you know, uh, you know, tying the kinship. So this is the broad... You, you, you're not going to find them in any church who are, you know, claimed to be, you know, guided by the Holy Ghost and Holy Ghost come upon them and they're, you know, dancing and, you know, singing and doing all kind of monkey gymnastic there. If you ask them to prove that or give them something new, which he's talking about, he's going to guide you onto all truth. He's going to teach you many things, which I had to tell you. He's going to bring remembrance to my words. Now, looking at these narration of the prophet, if you are a Christian and if you are an honest person, it's going to remind you of the teaching of Jesus. Your, your heart is telling you that this man sounds like Jesus. If we replace the word prophet here and add the word Christ here, that Christ, peace be upon him, said giving charity to a poor person is charity and giving it to relative is true charity. This is two things. Number one, charity, and number two is upholding the ties of kinship. You're going to wholeheartedly accept that. So uh, there is one last passage I'm going to quote. Uh, Jesus, uh, in Matthew 19, 19, he says, Honor your mother and father. Honor your parents in, in a nutshell. Now, Jesus told that we should honor our parents, but like how? Like every Tom, Dick, and Harry knows that, they, you know, we have to honor our parents, but how? The whole New Testament is silent about that, let alone the four Gospels. Okay, Jesus said that he's going to guide you into all truth, let alone leave, leave the four Gospels alone. Everything from the Apostles, uh, uh, the Acts of the Apostles to the last book of Revelation, the passages are silent about, you know, how one should treat their mother and father. And we all know that, okay, even Islamic passages talk about that and how we should treat our parents. But what if we, if, if our parents die or one of them dies, how should we, you know, help them? How should we even honor them after their death? Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, a man from Banu Salama, Banu Salama is an Arab tribe. A man came from an Arab tribe known as Banu Salama. To the Prophet ﷺ and ask, O Messenger of God, O Messenger of Allah, is there any obedience to parents left that I can show to them after their death? Now, you, you know, you, you gotta, you know, invest your Holy Ghost. What your Holy Ghost is, you know, preaching about that. If your parents are dead, how are you gonna honor them? How are you gonna how are you gonna, you know, make them feel good in, in, in their graves that they know in, in the other world that my, my my son or my daughter is doing something great? Ask your Holy Ghost about that. 
The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, yes, to pray for them, to supplicate for their forgiveness, to fulfill their promises after their death. If they had any contract and they died out of a sudden in a road accident or something like that, like they were not well prepared, they couldn't get, a, they couldn't get some time you know, to prepare their will, then fulfill their promises to maintain the ties of kinship, which cannot be maintained except through them. Like if your parents or one of them dies, like for instance, if your mother dies, then maintain the kinship through his, through her relationship. Like being, uh, honoring their, uh, honoring her sister or brother, like with your paternal, uh, sorry, maternal aunt or maternal uncle, honor them, feed them like your parents and honor their friends as well. Like if you had, if you had parents and they had very good friends and then now they're alone, they used to visit your parents and you know they, they feel all lonely now. So Prophet is like, treat them as your parents. Treat them as your parents used to treat them. Uh, you know, invite them to your houses. Invite them for a cup of tea, for a cup of coffee, or even for, you know, for a handsome meal. Uh, from, from the Eastern perspective, I'll, I'll, I'll offer my parents, uh, friends for biryani or korma or, you know, uh, tikka or uh, mutton kebab and stuff like that. So this is what Prophet is, you know, emphasizing that if, you, if your parents passed away, this is how you need to honor them by, you know, being good uh, to their nearest uh, people uh, into the terms of kinship and as well as friendship. And Jesus answered that, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, throughout the New Testament from apostles of Acts till the Revelation, how do you love your neighbor as yourself? The whole New Testament is silent about that. Even Jesus is silent about that after telling that, love your neighbor. That's it. Even there, there might be certain tiny passages, but it is talking about love your neighbor and you know turning the other cheek and stuff like that. But there's no whole description about that. When it comes to Islam, Islam has a whole lot of guidance. I mean, I had to shorten these passages in order to you know uh, shorten this presentation uh, because it's going to consume a lot of time. Islam comes up with a detailed description of how to honor your neighbor. Ibn Abbas informed Ibn Zubair, I heard the Prophet ﷺ said, he is not a believer whose stomach is filled while his neighbor goes hungry. You're having McDonald's and KFC or whatever, even though this is in our boycott list. And your neighbor, you don't even know about him, whether they had meal today or tonight or not, or whether they have even, they have got even anything since past, you know, a week. If, if you don't know about your neighbor, whether he's sleeping hungry or, you know, full stomach, you're not a believer. You're not a believer in God. This is what Prophet Muhammad is teaching. He further said, by Allah, by God, he is not a believer whose neighbor does not feel from his evil. The Prophet said that the worst of the sins is that you commit adultery with your neighbor's spouse, whether husband or wife. I'm being really quick here. I can talk about that all night long. I swear to God. And the Prophet ﷺ said in another narration, whoever has land and wants to sell it, let him offer it to his neighbor first. Let him ask his neighbor first that, hey, I'm going to sell this land. Are, are, you gonna, are, are you interested in that? And there's a whole, you know, jurisprudence about that in Islamic law that if you try selling your land without your neighbor's permission, that your neighbor, your neighbor can, you know, uh, put the case on you. He, he, he's going to file a lawsuit on you. This is how much neighbors are, you know, entitled for the rights in Islam. The Prophet said none of you should refuse to let his neighbor fix a piece of foot to his wall. The Prophet said Gabriel kept on commanding the neighbor to me so that I thought that he would make them err. Like, this is exactly what I'm saying. I'm telling you guys that in Islam, the neighbors are honored so much that the, even God, the messenger of God, feared that Gabriel kept commanding me how to, good, to, be, uh, how, how to be good with our neighbors. That I thought that one day Gabriel is going to come, the angel, the archangel Gabriel, he's going to come and command me that when you die, your, your, your property has some sort of share with your neighbor as well. This is what Prophet feared about, that how much you know, neighbors are honored in Islam. So... Um, these last passages I'm quoting, of course, you, your, you guys might be like, you know, he's, he says this is the last slide, but I'm, I'm going to, you know, but just, 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 just these, these are the last two slides and I'm done, inshallah. Now, here's a passage in the Quran where it says that, uh, O Prophet of God, the Holy Spirit has brought it down from your Lord. Quran chapter 16, verse 1 or 2. Tell them, say Prophet, O, o Prophet, tell these people that the Holy Spirit has brought it down from your Lord in truth and to make firm those who believe and as guidance and good tidings to those who submit. So here, Allah, the God of the Qur'an, is emphasizing that it is the Holy Spirit which came to Muhammad, who taught all those things. And this is what Jesus told, that the Holy Spirit is going to come. He, he's, he's discussing the Comforter. He's a, he has a Holy Spirit with him, and he's going to guide you into all truth. 
And this is another passage of the Quran. I'm, I, I'm sorry I have to summarize all this, or even though I can talk about that all night, but I need to summarize it because we all have uh, busy schedules in the life. There is another passage in the Quran, uh, Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 87. It says, And we gave Jesus, the Son of Mary, clear signs, miracles, and supported him with the Holy Spirit. So with this passage, I'm going to, uh, you know, end my presentation. Jazakumullahu khairan kaseera. Uh, guys, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Jazakumullahu